Hi, this is Peter Schweitzer, and welcome to The Drill Down, where we relentlessly expose cronyism, corruption, and the abuse of power in Washington, D.C. The co-host of this program, of course, Eric Eggers. Eric, welcome to 2024. A lot going on this year. We've got the Olympics. It's a leap year, and there are elections, of course, in the United States and other places around the world. Yeah, if you didn't know it was an election year, just wait, because that's all you're going to hear about (laughs) for the next complete uh, cycle. So it is an election year, and not just in the United States. I was surprised to learn that due to a kind of unique convergence of mathematical cycles, over half of the world's population is casting a ballot in some way, shape, or form this calendar year. Now, part of that's due to India, which apparently on its own almost comprises half the world's population. (laughs) But this is crazy as we think about, we're going to talk about problems in the United States and problems in elections elsewhere around the world. In India, by the way, 620 million people can cast a ballot and count it by having to show a photo ID all in the same day. so And they pull this off, and it's it's a developing country, right? We can't do it in the United States, but in India, a developing world country, they actually pull this off. I don't want us to get canceled, so I don't know if you're allowed to say developing country <laughs> anymore, but, but you'd like you to are. think that if India can do it, we can do it. Yes, you would like to think so. But we can't. Yeah, <laughs> as it can. turns out, yeah. but India can. Uh, and so, you know, when we'll talk about the problems, part of the reason why we can't do that in the United States. Um, but there was a really interesting article in The New Yorker about this like mass celebration in 2024 of democracy. And they talked about, you know, there's some elections are more free and fair than others. And the United States is considered to be among the freest and the fairest. Um, with, and that's probably fair to consider in some context, because let's, let's just talk about a few different elections in Taiwan. Uh, they're about to cast a uh, ballot on January 13th. There's a three-way race for president. And fun fact, there's been an unusual number of Chinese observation balloons <laughs> <laughs> in the Taiwan region. Are they carrying ballots by chance? No. <laughs> I mean, not yet. We don't know. They might be. Right. Uh, but Chinese officials are on record as saying, well, the Taiwan region ought to make the correct choice. Uh, and the implication mm-hmm. is that the wrong one may lead to war. Yeah. So there's yeah. that. So yep. there's some people casting ballots in Taiwan under some level of political pressure. Um, speaking of war, United States media darling Vladimir Zelensky in Ukraine yeah. has said that he doesn't intend for an election scheduled in March to take place because given war would be, quote, absolutely irresponsible to throw the topic of elections into society in a lighthearted and playful way. Yeah. They're in war, so yeah. they're going to suspend elections. And the New Yorker's take on that was, that choice may be comprehensible, yet it still feels like a loss and possibly a tragedy. <laughs> right, to not hold an election, yeah. It's amazing the different standards they have for different people. And of course, in Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin is almost certainly going to be reelected, right? Uh, uh, in an election in March, uh, his biggest political opponent, of course, Alexei Navalny, is in jail. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I don't mean quiet. to laugh on behalf of the Navalny right. family. I'm sure right. it's a real, right. you know, it's nice to have him home for Christmas. It didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's bad. But I think it's like, hey, in Russia, like, oh, Putin's clearly a dictator. It's no good because his political opponent is imprisoned. But in the United States, the potential and threatened imprisonment of Joe Biden's chief political rival is seen as necessary to protect democracy. That's right. That's right. Again, different standards depending on the context of the person. So we want to talk today not about Russian elections or Taiwanese elections per se, but it's important to put those in perspective to where we as a country sit. We want to talk about the forthcoming election in the United States. We want to talk about what's going on uh, with uh, Donald Trump and the prosecutions occurring there. Also, some very, very interesting comments by Frank Albergo, who's the national president of the Postal Police Officers Association. And I have to admit, I didn't actually know that such an organization exists, but these are actually the security officials on the postal system. And he came out with a statement that is rather shocking, basically saying, claiming that the Postal Service is going to de-emphasize the security of mail. There's a massive problem nationwide of mail being stolen. Uh, And of course, the reason we're interested in this is mail-in ballots in the election. So we're going to get to Mr. Albergo's comments as well um, and talk about what is the status of America's election coming forward? How 
clean as it going to be. Uh, forget all the theories that you hear. We're going to talk about practical things on the ground. So breaking news about Donald Trump and the prosecution taking place there. Fannie Willis, the Fulton County District Attorney, uh, apparently some rather salacious charges being made. Uh, and it seems like there's evidence for this. Yeah, this is from a, a filing from one of Donald Trump's many co-defendants. This is somebody that you know, Michael Roman, yes. or at least you know who he is. And so yeah. you would say he's somebody that conducts investigations he's like going to find out information yeah very smart guy uh i knew him before he joined uh uh the trump white house but he is a very smart researcher and investigator uh and he was one of 19 charged in in uh, georgia the irony is the grand jury said no you shouldn't charge roman we don't think that he did anything wrong so then here's a question if, if the grand jury said that fewer people should be charged than were actually charged right why would they charge this many people i was thinking well it's because they're trying to put political or criminal pressure on more people to get them to like flip and be collaborators right. with the you're state. thinking like a, a, a legitimate lawyer but it turns right. out that may be another reason for <laughs> them to charge more people because while Fannie Willis is the Fulton County District Attorney, she's actually not the person leading the actual prosecution of Donald Trump. That's right. And what's interesting is that she hired a prosecutor um, to a pro special prosecutor, a special prosecutor, <laughs> special in <laughs> apparently multiple ways. The special prosecutor, uh, Mr. Wade, Nathan Wade, is a private attorney, and he has been running up legal fees because he was hired in 2022 to prosecute this case. A uh, couple of interesting things about uh, Mr. Wade. Number one, he's actually never uh, he's uh, a prosecuted. Really, he's prosecuted. a great listener. <laughs> yeah, he's a great <laughs> listener. He's never actually prosecuted a RICO case, a racketeering case, which is what this case is. So he's a bizarre selection. But then it starts to make more sense when the allegation by Mike Roman and his team is that one Fannie Willis and Mr. Nathan Wade are romantically involved and in fact he's getting he's been paid more than six hundred and fifty thousand dollars thus far in legal fees for this work he's doing to prosecute donald trump and he is turning around and apparently taking fanny willis on some really 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 nice vacations now you can be friends and go to napa <laughs> and you can be friends and go on cruises so i think that's one of the things that the mr roman's team's gonna have to prove you know just how special is the relationship between the district attorney and the special prosecutor the very special prosecutor you, you noted that um he was appointed despite his never having actually prosecuted a felony before which would seem to raise eyebrows if, you've, if you're the person that's been selected to prosecute the former president of the United States. Uh, another sort of fun fact about Nathan Wade's appointment is that it happened without the approval of the Fulton County Board. Which is apparently required. Which is required by law. Uh, and so the idea that, you know, the Fulton Board of Commissioners didn't approve it, and then he gets appointed to this position, you know, also fun fact, the day before he filed for his divorce. Yeah. <laughs> Cobb County. <laughs> so just to be clear, you've got Fannie Willis hiring this guy, Nathan Wade, to be the special prosecutor. Who has no experience no in this No experience case, yeah. prosecuting a felony. He is appointed one day before he files for a divorce, and then he proceeds to be paid $600,000 from Fannie Willis's office, some of which he then spends, and this is what is alleged in the court filing, because they're in this romantic relationship, taking her on trips to Napa Valley, they go to Florida, they cruise on Caribbean together, uh, using tickets that we know that Mr. Wade purchased. Yeah. And so that's what's in the filing recently. Now, again, you've got lots of experts saying, well, just because these things are this, that doesn't mean that Fannie <laughs> right. Willis made the wrong choice in pursuing right. these prosecutions. Right. It just means that some of her ethics could be taken a second look at. Well, it, what, it, what it shows to me, honestly, is that this is more of a grift than it is a serious legal prosecution. Because set aside, you know, what I think are kind of the farcical charges here against Trump in Georgia. Uh, if she was actually of the serious mind that we're going after the former president of the United States, these are serious charges. We need to really have a keen legal mind. She would not be picking Mr. Wade, who has no experience and background in doing this. So to me, it's a grift. It's a grift. It's a way to effectively launder money. You know, you hire this guy who is your boyfriend to be the, the very special prosecutor. You pay him hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then he in return takes that money, the, his income, and takes you on these elaborate vacations. That's sort of classical in a criminal sense 
what criminals do. That's money laundering. It's it's money laundering. It's it's not a great look. You know, we'll <laughs> say that it's a choice. Maybe not the one that you might make. If like, I mean, in all seriousness, and this is why we're talking about in the context of this sort of Mickey Mouse stuff that happens in these other countries right. in other elections. When yeah, of course it's ridiculous that Vladimir Putin's got his main political opponent in jail. It would also seem to be ridiculous that the person leading the prosecution of Joe Biden's chief political opponent would hire their boyfriend to lead that prosecution and then benefit financially from the right. fact that they're paying him to do it. And it does seek, speak to like a lack of seriousness, either that or yeah. uh, the feeling of impunity. They can yes. do anything they yes. feel like they can because anything is justifiable as long as it's against Donald Trump. Anything is justifiable. You can suppress Hunter Biden's laptop. You can work with big tech to like promote the idea that Donald Trump's a Russian agent if it means that Donald Trump stays out of the office because this is the stuff they've done and this is just like kind of falls in line with this playbook. Here's the irony uh, is that the checks sent from Nathan Wade or sent to Nathan Wade from Fulton County and then the fact they used that money to purchase vacations for Fannie Willis could amount to, according to the filing, on a services fraud, which is a federal crime. Yeah. And it could also be prosecuted under the federal racketeering statute, which, <laughs> drumroll please, is the same statute they're charging Donald Trump under. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's right. Well, and of course, Mr. Wade knows nothing about that because it's not familiar. <laughs> He's like, damn it, I missed that. <laughs> it's really crazy. And it, to me, it goes to the question of what is the motivation here? Um, I think there are lots of legal grounds. And, and many people that are actual legal scholars have commented on the fact that the Trump prosecutions under RICO are ridiculous. It is a racketeering law designed to go after criminal organizations. Here you are going after a political campaign uh, and you're trying to use those statutes. But set that aside. What it goes to is what is the motivation here? I mean, if she's sincerely motivated by a desire to balance the scales of justice because she thinks something was wrong, she would not be hiring Nathan Wade to do it. He has no experience. She would would have gone through the procedures of getting the county board to approve this which is required by law she's ignoring all of this it speaks to kind of self-motivation she's trying to make a name for herself politically uh and she's trying to you know feather the nest a little bit but if she had gone through the fulton county board she wouldn't have been able to appoint him as a divorce present so <laughs> you know, can understand sometimes the calendar holds us hostage yeah it's crazy things. it's crazy so we're going to keep a watch on that we're certainly going to keep a watch on the case but i think even more interesting because of a more far reaching impact than this case in Georgia because honestly I think even if you had this Fulton, Fulton County uh, uh, you know jury uh, convict Trump I think it would be overturned on appeal it's just ridiculous but the broader problem is we're going into 2024 wide scale mail-in balloting has become the norm you first wrote about this in 2018 in your book fraud about election fraud uh, it's become the norm and now we have this warning that has come out by Frank Albergo, who's the national president of the Postal Police Officers Association. Tell us why you think mail-in balloting is a security problem and what Albergo is telling us and why we should be worried about it. Yeah, and by the way, you're a best-selling author and generally considered one of the smartest guys I know, so it makes me feel better that you are in the same thing. The national, uh, the Postal Police Officers Association would have been a category in things I didn't know existed two days ago, right? Right. right. Uh, but it's a real thing, and I think to be clear, the reason why these are connected, the reason why Donald Trump's uh, prosecution, who is leading the prosecution, is relevant to discuss in terms of the problems with mail-in ballot and, and the fact that they're probably going to increase in this country is part of what Donald Trump's being charged with is undermining the confidence in the security of U.S. elections, right? right. By, by, by raising questions right. about the legitimacy of it, they said, well, he was trying to steal the election. Right. So, But then if you have questions about the ways in which we conduct elections, which I think are very fair and legitimate, then how are you to legally, and I think fairly, and in the spirit of promoting and enhancing democracy, not undermine it, question some of these methodologies? And that's what Frank Albergo is trying to do. So he posted on LinkedIn that he was just informed by the Postal Service that the language as it relates to the post, the, the purpose of the Postal Security Force is going to change. So up until this year, the purpose was the Postal Security Force service to protect the Postal Service, its employees and customers, secure the nation's mail system, yep. and ensure that American public's continued trust in the mail. Notice that secure the nation's mail system. And yep. we're going to talk a little bit about that. But, but that was one of the primary objectives. What is he saying the new mission or the new language of the Postal Police is supposed to be? It's the new language is to provide perimeter and building security services at U.S. Postal Service facilities. In execution of that function, the enforcement authority of the Postal Police is restricted to real property owned or controlled by the U.S. Postal Service. 
And he went on to say that, God forbid, the Postal Service utilizes its uniform police force to protect the mail and letter carriers. Uh, and this is if, if what he's saying is accurate and true, we don't have any reason to doubt it. But why it's really shocking is there's a massive problem in this country. He talks about it. There's plenty of evidence. We're going to talk about it with um, mail being stolen, mail not being secure. There's huge problems with mail-in ballots that either disappeared or were fraudulent. Uh, and the purpose of the postal uh, police was to effectively try to combat that and deal with it. He's saying that their new mission, according to the Postal Service authorities in Washington, is to not even worry about that anymore. And yet we're going to have a mail in election where tens of millions of ballots potentially are going to be mailed in. Yeah, the U.S. Postal Service may not be an actual dumpster fire, but I think it's fair to consider it to be an actual letter drop box fire. Right. Because it's it's not good. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not good. They, the Postal Service, just to be clear, lost two and a half billion dollars in the first quarter yeah. of 2023. Now, I know it's not set up to be profitable, and that's why you see things that are competitors to that but it's it's not great you know they continue to change the definition of when something's delivered on time and that just speaks to like an overall macro efficiency or lack thereof problem but um you know you found last month and we talked about this actually when we got to guest host sean Haney's radio show but it's worth repeating that the heartland institute and erasmus and reports did a poll in which they people in 2020 admitted one out of five said they committed some kind of voter fraud and the most dominant form of voter fraud would be filling out a ballot in part on behalf of a friend or family member. Now, it's worth pointing out that didn't happen in uh, the polling place, right? Like yeah. Because that happened with an absentee ballot, with a mail-in ballot. Um, people have admitted 17% said they voted in a state where you're no longer a permanent resident. Once again, that happened by casting a mail-in ballot. 17% of mail-in voters also admitted to sign the ballot on behalf of a friend or family member. So like this Rasmussen poll last month admits that a significant fraction of people participating in mail-in balloting are committing some sort of fraud. Yeah, and there's there's lots of headlines. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this to, to confirm that. November 1st of 2023, judge orders new mayoral primary after a woman seen on video placing stack of ballots into absentee drop box. That's a big deal, by the way. That's big a, deal. It's a mayoral race in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And so you said they took what they took. And they, by the way, we never got this in uh, Georgia in 2020. That's actually what the Dinesh D'Souza film, that's part of what they did because we we're like, well, wait a minute. You can set up these drop boxes. We did analysis to show the drop boxes are more dominant in Biden friendly areas right. and that the ballots from there end up being like helping to help establish a significant margin of victory for Joe Biden in those areas. They were supposed to be monitored by cameras, but we were never able to get that camera footage. We FOIA'd it. And so I think the fact that when you get that camera footage and you show people showing up with stacks of ballots, that was what they used to generate a new election. Yep. For a mayor in Dane, Connecticut. Yeah. And in Wisconsin, elected official charged with trying to receive false mail and absentee ballots via mail in New York in uh, January of 2023. New York election official used voter information to receive a dozen false ballots. Uh, U.S. Postal Service uh, uh, report in 2020, USPS data shows thousands of mailed election ballots missed election day deadlines. Oops. This is a, a major problem. The list goes on and on and on. So the notion that you can have widespread mail-in ballots, you don't require any ID, obviously, by its nature. People just sign their name on it or somebody else's name on it. Ballots are getting lost. Ballots are being manipulated. The notion that you can have a mail-in ballot system and people are going to have quote magical confidence in it because our government officials tell us is absolutely patently ridiculous and now that based on what's being told the the postal police are being told to do there apparently is going to be even more of this because the postal police is is essentially being told it is no longer their job to secure the nation's mail system i think if there's one thing that we can assume about postal police officers they're clearly people that wear their cell phones on their hips, right? Like that's <laughs> got to be part of like they they have like keychains on their belt and their yeah. phones that they're in. They're, they're walking that way. No, our mail in problems, our, our mail -in system, and the mail security is a real problem. I mean, literally a headline from yesterday uh, in Needham, Massachusetts, and this is I mean, talk about like just raising the white flag. Police have said. Please stop using these <laughs> these ballot or these uh, mailboxes. Police are pleading with residents yeah. of Needham, Massachusetts, to stop using mailboxes after a series of threat of thefts. There's 25 collection points in the Needham, Massachusetts area that police said you should stop using immediately because a series of 
I guess, assaults or robberies of postal carriers. Yeah. They took their keys. Yeah. And so now they're just using those keys to go around and open up mailboxes and grab whatever they want to. Apparently a practice, uh, actually we work with a guy who said he had his mail stolen recently, just taken it out of his mailbox because of the Christmas card season, people are looking for cash, looking for gift cards. But people are getting more sophisticated than that. They're going in, they're fishing out checks and they take a yeah. check and you can apparently wash the check, change the name on it and then cash the check. One lady said she had a check for $10,000 she never received that was cashed. So, I mean, if people can do this for that, and this gets back to the whole, like, do we not think that they would exploit the vulnerability of the mail system when the future of a presidential or other elections are at stake? Right. And the stakes are so high. That's the point. The motivation is there. You've got two very different visions of America between uh, Joe Biden or if Joe Biden's not the candidate, whoever replaces him and Donald Trump or whoever the Republican nominee is. Massive chase. You've got massive motivation. Uh, here by people who control uh, uh, the strings of power, uh, so to speak, uh, to use this system. And yet the response from our elected officials in Washington, D.C. is just trust the system, just trust the system. The well, 2020 election was the fairest they ever conducted and yeah. the most secure in the yeah. history of U.S. democracy. And if you question that, you're going to be charged by Fannie Willis's boyfriend. <laughs> Exactly I mean, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Welcome to America. Is this South America? Is this some developing world country? Is this Russia? I mean, what is this? I mean, this is the kind of situation that we're facing today. We're laughing about it, but we're just laughing about it because to see how far America has fallen. And that's not to say there haven't been elections in the past, the 1960 election, JFK and Nixon. There were all kinds of allegations about the mob, you know, fixing votes in Chicago. Which to me only supports claims against. Of course, you know, like all that should do is make it more legitimate to question the integrity of things. When we know it's like baked into the story of the 1960s. Oh, Kennedy. Yeah, he had his buddy is like the mob that stole it from Nixon. It's like it's happened. Yes, it's happened. And and that was localized. They didn't have mail in ballots on right. the scale that we have. And now you can, you know, literally run an operation where you're collecting ballots in a lot of states, probably like Pennsylvania and others are going to be sending out. Uh, ballots en masse to all registered voters, whether they've requested one or not. Uh, and then you're going to have potentially 20 percent of the people again filling out these false ballots. It's really a, a, a sad situation. And the question is, when are people going to stand up in Washington and actually insist on action? More importantly, when are they going to do it at the state level? Because a lot of these raw laws are written at the state level. Where we are in Florida, um, I will say that the legislature in DeSantis has really tightened it up. We have early voting, but you have to show up. You have to show your ID. Uh, mailing ballot is much more difficult. It's these swing states like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and Georgia that you really worry about abuse taking and place. And oh, by the way, the Michigan Secretary of State, who is one of the people that was helped elevated to that role because of the work of George Soros and their Secretary of State project. So, I mean, she's not some hardliner, but she's even said, look, the mail system was insufficient leading up to the 2020 election to make sure all the ballots got there. I think that was actually part of her rationale for helping use ballot harvesters. But the point is, people have admitted on a bipartisan level, even going back to this committee that was chaired by James Baker and Jimmy Carter. Yeah, the mailing system for balloting is not great. Yeah. It's the least secure we have. Yet we did the most ever ballots in that system in 2020. And we were told it was the most secure. And that's, I think, is like the biggest problem with this discussion. And that's maybe the most important thing that podcasts like these and the work that other people are doing is you have to be able to have an honest, I think, an intellectually honest conversation about it. Because otherwise, you're told, hey, when Georgia, right, right which said, listen, we, we're we going to certify the results of this 2020 election, but we're also going to make some changes to help inspire and restore confidence in the integrity of that. And then George is like, oh, yeah. So what that means is you can't pass out political literature within a certain number of feet of the ballot box. <laughs> right. That's always been how we do it. Right. And right. they're like, OK, racist, we're going to take the Major League Baseball right. All-Star game from you for that. Right. So there's and then Donald Trump's like, hey, I think there's a question about this. Fannie Willis is like, OK, Rico statute. So, right. right. I mean, you have to be able to have a conversation. And there's a very significant penalty for people that have tried to stand up and um just speak on behalf of the importance of election integrity. So that's going to be the number one thing that has to happen because you just have to be a lot, be honest about it. Yeah. You have to be honest about it. And I think you also have to be smart and clear about it. Look, there's a lot of crazy theories that have been out there about voting machines and, and, and all these sorts of things, you know, and, and a, a lot of that is obviously highly, highly in dispute. Um, but when it comes to mail-in ballots, the evidence is overwhelming. It's clear. And the voices are coming from all corners. So, you're going to vote in 2024? Uh, as long as um, Nathan Wade says it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to go to Napa to talk to him about it. <laughs>
<laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, we're both planning to vote. We hope that you will as well. Um, I think mail-in balloting is probably going to be here in some form in the future, but let's hope that we get the security right on this because the future of our country is at stake. So we appreciate you as always uh, tuning in and listening to The Drill Down. You can find information about some of the research we're doing at thedrilldown.com, and you can find this podcast wherever fine podcasts are located. Thanks for joining us again. Until next time.